Welcome back, I'm your host Teresa, and today we're talking about our freaky Greeky friends in the top 10 bizarre traditions from ancient Greece. Number 10, it's happy name day to you. Birthdays are basic and boring. Here in ancient Greece, we practice name days, a celebration of your birth title. In ancient Greece, names were deemed incredibly important and were given in a way meant to ideally define what a person would be like and grow to be. A great example is Aristotle, a compound name with Aristos meaning best and Telos meaning end. Pretty fitting and ironic for someone who would become the best philosopher of the time and also have a pretty not great end. Anyways, this importance of names meant that every name had its own special day in the calendar. So instead of celebrating your exit of the womb, you'd wait for whatever day was your given one and coincided with your name and that's what you'd celebrate. Name days aren't just in Greek culture and can be found in ones such as Eastern Europe and the Balkan regions and some still celebrate name day to this day. Some of us still get phone calls from angry aunts wondering why they weren't wished happy name day on Facebook. Since it rhymes with wine, number 9 is water it down. We know that many ancient civilizations didn't drink water due to how polluted it was. Whether that pollution was salt or feces, well it varied. Anyways, while many drank beer, the Greeks drank wine. However, drinking alcohol at every time of the day doesn't mean that there's a free pass to be drunk. Quite the opposite actually, as heavy drinking and drunkenness was looked down upon and seen as an embarrassment. This is because the Greeks associated it with barbarism, and many of their gods and their Pantheon's behaviors and stories also attributed to this. Wine without water was only used as medicine for sick or during travel as a tonic. As a result, the Greeks may have been pounding back the wine, but it was water diluted ratio, so the standard was 1 to 4. They even had a special container for mixing, boiling, and then cooling this diluted mixture. Oh, and by the way, it was seawater they were using, because apparently, to quote, seawater gives the wine a curious salinity, which mixes with the sweetness of the grape and produces a delicate taste, while at the same time preserving the wine for longer. Number 8 is he who must not be named. This is one of the pettiest and most specific ones you'll probably ever hear, and it's all because one dude screwed up so phenomenally it started an actual tradition. So what happened here was there was this Greek shepherd named Aristratus, and this guy had an idea one day to, you know, set fire to and destroy the temple of Artemis in Esphus. So keep in mind he did this in an era where the Greeks revered their gods the way that modern day religions like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Islam, etc. do. These gods are real to them, so why would they destroy her temple? Which, by the way, is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world in our modern time. When pissed off Greeks came and found him to ask that same question, Aristotle essentially said his only intention in doing this was to achieve fame and his name to go on into history, the way that Alexander or Achilles had. He didn't care if it was in a good or a bad way, he just wanted that. Well, the entirety of Greece collectively said F that. Once his intentions were revealed, mentioning his name or naming children Aristotle Stratus was forbidden at the risk of being sentenced to death penalty. And so it became tradition that no one in Greece was to have that name. Number 7 is don't open dead outside. In traditional Grecian lore, it was said that there was these walking dead as creatures. Legend forewarns that these creatures would rise from the graves at night to knock on the door of innocent civilians, saying their names repetitively as a lure to open up, as these creatures, kinda in a, like a vampire fashion, have to be invited in. If you didn't answer your door on the first knock, you were safe and no harm could come to you. However, if people were unfortunate enough to answer, they would die after a few days and then would be transformed into one of these creatures themselves. This is why the Greeks had a tradition, arguably even a superstition, that you should never answer the door on the first knock. Many still follow this tradition to date. Number 6, you don't want to be the bigger man. We've all seen the Grecian statues, whether in photo format or lucky enough to see them in galleries or in the country it's themselves. But what we can all agree on is there's one added appendage that's hard to avoid noticing. Or is it? You may have noticed on male statues from ancient Greece that while they include his private regions, they are noticeably quite, well, small on every single statue. Well, this is a tradition that actually has an explanation that's nothing to do with shrinkage. In ancient Greece, a small package was actually coveted and seen as the pinnacle of male form. This is because it was consistently depicted in their lore that being well endowed was something for the mundane or barbarians. So traditionally in ancient lore, only foolish males ruled by lust had large, well, you get the idea. Finally, an explanation for the question we've all thought, uh, nobody said out loud. Number 5 is the dirty gal. And sadly, it is so not in a fun way, rather the opposite. For some wild reason, the Greeks believed women had a really unique susceptibility to the things deemed impure. This is everything gross you could think of. So pus, feces, discharges and secretions, animal dung, rotten foods, the whole shebang. These things affected women in a way they did not affect men. Sure, it didn't mean she was more easily grossed out by it, but it also must 
must mean that it's better for her. So, naturally, literal filth became part of the treatments for ladies. One awful example is how a woman suffering from a discharge could be prescribed to drink roasted mule dung mixed with hot wine. If you lost your baby amidst that tragedy, they'd be rubbing cow dung all over you. If you've seen some of our medieval videos, you may have heard about the whole wandering womb concept of the olden times, where people believe that a womb could just wander around inside a woman's body or just vacate it entirely as if it's got little legs. Well, anyways, the whole reason for the cow dung thing is they believe that the womb would be so disgusted by the smell of dung that it would run away and leave her of the trauma. And so the tradition for terrible, filthy medicine for the women of Greece carried on for centuries. Number four is another questionable medical tradition, plan sneeze. So this is the fault of one dude specifically. Unlike Estrostratus, he didn't get his name banned forever, however. So Greek physician Soneris was one of the best women's physicians you could find. No concept of how a woman's body worked and full confidence that he did. Perfect combo. He pitched that if women didn't want to get pregnant after, you know, doing it, they should squat, sneeze, and rinse. And just like that, you're pregnancy immune. Well, word spread of this method that allowed people to avoid weird olden contraceptives and not get preggers, so tons of people did it and tons of people got pregnant. Unfortunately, word of it not working did not spread as fast as the rumor that it did, and this tactic carried on in many regions of Greece for decades. Don't worry, Sonaris had a couple backup ideas. He also suggested rubbing honey or cedar resin on your hoo-ha before getting down, which was probably entirely too efficient between the mess and the burning sensation making people just call it quits on the act altogether for a while. Number three is before he cheats. Hold off on the baseball bat and the keys, Carrie. The Greeks got this one covered. Infidelity was a huge no-no and was even classified as a crime in ancient Greek customs. This went on for both men and women. If you were to be called before the courts and found guilty of this act, there were a few punishments, none of which maimed or ended your life. No, 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 no. They were quite unique. One of the most common was to insert peeled ginger root into the genital orifices of a man or a woman. This would cause intolerable burning sensation and pain to the intimate parts of the unfaithful. Another one was to have the pubic hair on your derriere burnt off with smoldering ash, which sounds just… I mean another option was a radish that had small holes in it pushed in your back door, which would be very itchy and very burny. Yeah, suffice to say cheating on your partner back then wouldn't result in getting your stuff tossed out on the front lawn or your PS5 drowned, more so in a seriously ingrained lesson on commitment via vegetables. Number two is the phallic festival. Huzzah! The time has come for us all to gather in the Acropolis and gaze down on the wondrous sight of oh, hoo hoo. I mean, if you're a visitor, sure your reaction may be one of shock, but to the people of Athens, this tradition was highly cultivated and something people looked forward to year round. Once a year, their roads would come alive with all kinds of depictions and representations of male genitalia. This happened during the annual Dionysus celebration, a god of pleasure and wine, where men and women would march down the streets holding giant phalli proudly above their heads as a tribute to their gods, all while drunk out of their minds and on their way in a phallic procession to the temple of Dionysus. According to Aristotle, phallic processions were the birthplace of comedic theater. He claimed that people adapted the jokes they'd yell during the parade processions into full stage plays. So if Aristotle's right, all comedy began with the Greeks carrying giant cartoony dongs. And it's number one, the axe did it. Ah, projection, everyone's favorite guilt relief. This fable begins when the Athenians sacrificed foods and vegetables to the gods, not animals. Ironically, this is how they start. An altar for Zeus had been set up holding grains and cakes as a sacrifice, and when a wandering ox came across the altar, it trampled much of it and ate the sacrificial food. Well, like I previously mentioned, their gods were very real to them, and a man named Thalon, in anger, then killed the ox with an axe. Thalon was the first Athenian in the city to have killed an ox, and he fled, leaving the axe behind at the crime scene. The witnesses to the scene were shocked by the event and moved to prosecute Thelon for the murder of the ox. Despite his absence, they held a trial to charge Thelon, but it still didn't resolve the sense of communal responsibility for the murder of an ox going on without justice. An oracle spoke up, telling the Athenians they should eat the ox in a feast and repeat the sacrifice every year to compensate. So the next year, a group of ox were to be led to the original altar. Whatever one ate from the altar, that was the one to be killed. He was struck with an axe and then killed by the 
a member of the Athelonian family who would then throw the axe down and run away just like their ancestor. The other participants in the ritual then butchered and skinned the animal with a sacrificial knife and feasted on the meat. This could not be the end of the ritual however because a crime had been committed. The ox had been slain just like before so it's back to square one with another trial. Since the ox slayer had to flee, the girls who brought the water for sharpening the weapon were charged. Their defense was that those who actually sharpened the axe and knife were more responsible. The sharpeners in turn charged the man who gave them the axe and knife and then that guy, he charged the butcher. But the butcher claimed the knife was more guilty because it did the cutting and since the knife could say nothing in its defense it was found guilty. And then the knife was banished by being thrown into the sea. To conclude this bizarre ritual, back on Acropolis the skin of the ox was stuffed, stood up and harnessed to a plow, restoring it to its pre-sacrificial condition. And so they did this every year for centuries. The end. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this fun and wacky video. Feel free to like and subscribe to see more and comment down below what you'd love to learn more about.